Hi, I'm Ozzy Oswald, and welcome to Religion and Life. When we use phrases like morality, free will, and evil, we normally are thinking in terms of theological concepts. My guest today, Dr. Andrew Monroe, studies these concepts as a product of social cognition and tests them in a lab. Thank you, Dr. Monroe, for taking your time today to come and talk with us about absolutely. this. Absolutely. Thank I'm, you so much I'm, for having me. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm fascinated by your research because you're dealing with concepts that philosophers and theologians and religious people talk about. Mm -hmm. And if I were to describe a task or a class to my students with phrases like evil and free will and morality, they would immediately think of a religion class or mm -hmm. a theology class. Absolutely. Yet you are a, well, an experimental Psychologist, mm -hmm. I, I guess, would be uh, a good description. Yes. And you're testing these concepts in a lab. Could you tell us just a, a little bit to get us oriented to how this works yeah. and, and what you're looking for? Yeah, so my lab is, is interested in uh, trying to understand how people make moral judgments. And, and that is, we know that we do this all the time, that uh, we can't hardly open the newspaper or talk with friends about making some type of moral evaluation about the world that we live in. And so the questions that my lab tries to answer is, well, how do we go from perceiving a moral right or a moral wrong or something that we believe is morally right or wrong mm -hmm. and going from that to actually figuring out, well, this person deserves some blame or punishment or reward for their right. behavior. And so what my lab studies is the cognitive process going from observing morally relevant things in the world to the output of deciding about blame and punishment and reward and praise. Hmm. Uh, and the way that we study this is, as you said, with experimental methodologies from psychology. So we look at how do people's judgments change when they find out new information? What right. beliefs do people have about their own free will and how do those beliefs about free will affect their behavior? Uh, and we also look at the types of moral values that people hold as personally relevant and how those moral values change the way that they perceive other people and change the way that they behave towards them. Hmm. So if we were um, ta talking about this in theological terms, we might use phrases like morality, sin, mm -hmm. judgment, yeah. redemption even. Yes. Um, okay, well, we, uh, we sent a camera crew uh, to your lab mm -hmm. uh, this week, and we have a short video that I'd like for us to look at. And... Uh, this is a, just a short excerpt of one of your graduate assistants, I believe, mm -hmm. conducting an experiment. So uh, maybe we can watch this for a moment and then uh, talk about it just sure. a bit. Sure, absolutely. Okay? All right, let's see what we have here. So the first thing you're going to be doing is reading a short description of event. After about two seconds, the program will advance and you'll be asked to decide how much blame the person deserves. After that, you're going to be given some new information to read and you'll have a chance to modify your original judgment in light of the new information. So your job today is to make the best judgment you can, even if you feel like you do not have very much information. So to make this judgment, you're going to use a sliding scale that you can move with your mouse and drag this cursor to the appropriate place on the scale. Mm -hmm. All right, if that all makes sense, then you can feel free to go ahead and start the study. very much for participating in our experiment. This sheet gives some of the details about what it is that we're interested in the lab. So what we were doing to, in today's experiment was an, a study on moral updating. And what that is is we're interested in how people update their moral judgments. So the task that you did today, you got a little bit of information, you made a moral judgment about it, and then you got some new information about what the person's motives were, their intentions, or what they might have known at the time. And so what we're interested in here is how people's judgments change over time, whether or not people's judgments are sort of dynamic, changing, responding to new information, or whether or not people's moral judgments seem to, to really be kind of sticky. Okay, so that was really interesting there, what you're doing in the lab. You've got uh, students answering questions about hypothetical situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, as I understand it, providing them more information about an issue and seeing if then they change their judgments uh, yeah, based on, exactly. on moral decisions and morality of a person. Yep. And uh, so tell us what you found. Uh, uh, and, and you call this um, 
concept you're testing here in the lab in this video, moral mm -hmm. updating, is that correct? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So in this series of studies, what we're interested in is, uh, the way that we do these studies is we give people a really basic moral event. Uh, so something like, Frank hit Matt. So you know in this case that there's someone, there's a victim, there's a perpetrator, and that something bad happened. Mm -hmm. And that's actually enough for people to make moral judgments in most cases. So we have them make a moral judgment about this. And then after they make this judgment, we fill out the event a little bit, much like you would do if someone's telling you a story or if you're reading something in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And we tell you something about, well, what was the person's motives or their intentions or what did they know at the time? And then what we're interested in in this case is how do people's judgments change when they get this new information? And what we find is that people hold their moral judgments in these really sort of surprisingly fluid ways mm. that whenever they find out new information about someone's mind, like if you did something intentionally versus accidentally, right. they update their judgments uh, really sort of carefully. Uh, and we were quite surprised by this. So there's a lot of work in uh, moral psychology that suggests that the way that people make judgments is sort of uh, in, in a way that they really want to hold on to blame, that they don't want to let people off the hook. And what we're showing here is actually the way that people seem to be making these types of moral judgments is in a really sort of careful, almost calibrated type of way that they are sensitive to evidence, they're sensitive mm -hmm. to information. And, and this really makes sense. The way that we're thinking about this is that our moral judgments are actually for helping us navigate the social world. They're help about, they help us uh, moderate the other, peop uh, other people's behavior. So like, if I do something bad to you right. and you express a moral judgment, you do so to try to change my behavior. And so we think the way that we think of moral judgments is that there's something that really matter for our, our everyday social lives. Okay, so if, if um, people making moral judgments mm -hmm. are in effect moderating the behavior of others, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's got to be some starting point or body of information about where those judgments are coming from. Yes. Is how are those folks making the judgments basing their, their um, ideas of right and wrong? Mm -hmm. where, where are those basic kind of ideas coming from. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That I mean, the starting point for morality has to be an agreed upon set of norms of behavior, like codes of conduct about what is permissible or impermissible. And, and that's, I mean, that's a social construct, is it? As, absolutely. So yeah. I mean, we get these from uh, our parents, our, the culture that we live in, from uh, our uh, religious individuals, so our priests or our pastor telling us about like what the accepted codes of conduct are in our particular uh, religion. So these are all, we have to have these sets of norms in order for moral judgment to get off the ground. Because mm -hmm. the first thing that we've got to do in order to make a moral judgment is to see something that says, uh, oh, this is something that I should care about in a moral way rather than like a sort of social way, like putting a fork on the wrong side of a plate. Like right. that's <laughs> not correct, but it's not moral either. Right. So that's, that's really interesting. So one of the parts of the social setting in the context is religion. It may not be the only place moral ideas come from, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, at least in um, our contemporary setting, uh, religion has played a role in Absolutely. setting uh, these moral guidelines. Uh, but it seems to me that, that one of the outcomes of your research suggests that um, the way people make moral judgments evolves, mm -hmm. that, that it's um, dynamic in yes. a sense. Um, and that almost contrasts with the way we tend to think about religious truth, right? That it's unchanging, mm -hmm. that morality is static. So is there, is there a conflict, I wonder, in the minds of people who are trained religiously yeah. uh, in terms of, of um, their evolving kind of moral precepts and, and judgments? Is no, I think that, that's a really excellent question. And I, I don't think there's actually a conflict there that you'd say, so the way that I, I would think about this is, the sort of religious norms, so for instance, like thou shalt not kill. This right. is a, a, a moral truth. Uh, it's enshrined in the Ten Commandments. And the way that we make a moral judgment about that, we, our, our participants in our experience would agree that killing is wrong. Where the, you might get a slight difference, and even I, I think one that people who are religiously trained would agree with, is that it matters whether or not you are killing for morally good reasons or morally bad reasons. So like mm -hmm. if I kill someone in order to like get the insurance money for, for their death, uh, that's, that's morally wrong. I would deserve a lot of blame and punishment for that. But we might say that if I have if I have to kill someone in order to like, protect my family and someone is invading my home mm -hmm. and this is my last resort, we might still say that that is morally unfortunate and we wish that that didn't happen, but we wouldn't punish me in the same type of way. So we can still maintain that, that core moral truth of thou shalt not kill, right. but we can say, but someone's motives uh, matter in those cases. Okay. 
And one of the, it seems to me one of the implications of your lab work mm -hmm. and your research, and I find this fascinating too, is that in a sense you are controlling the moral judgments of your subjects by feeding them information. So yeah. you're, you're controlling uh, those judgments in a way uh, with the flow of information. Does that happen in the real world in a, in a sense or could it happen? It seems to me it might happen in law courts, for example. Yeah, so what we're trying to do in these types of experiments is to model more closely the way that people make judgments in, in real everyday life. And, and this set of moral updating studies is a first step in that direction because you know oftentimes when we tell moral stories to our friends about how we were either helped or mistreated, the first thing that we tell them is what event happened? And then we fill it out. And, and so morality is really a lot like storytelling. Right. And what we're trying to do in some future experiments that uh, I'm developing with my graduate students and my undergraduate students right now is looking at moral judgment in real time. Hmm. And so what we're doing right now is we're having people listen to stories, moral stories, or having them watch uh, morally relevant stories. And they've got this, uh, what we've sort of uh, referred to as the dial of blame. <laughs> and, and it's a little box where you can turn up or down how much blame you feel the person deserves. Right. And in this way, we can better model exactly how people are making moral judgments mm. in their everyday lives. That as they're hearing information, what is that doing to their moral perceptions? Are they driving blame up or down? Uh, and so we can, we can actually map that in real time. You're watching what's going on in their mind at the time. Exactly. Right. So uh, I want to talk about values in a second. But mm -hmm. before that, uh, let me just ask you this. And this may be outside the realm of your research a bit. But what happens uh, when one person, say, is informed, their, their morality is informed by, let's say, a conservative religious perspective that's outside of what we would consider mainstream mm -hmm. uh, religion? Um, so they're, they're kind of in an out group, I guess, um, and, and don't fit with the the established social norms mm -hmm. on a particular issue. Uh, are, are they drawn toward the, the normative views or are, they, uh, are those walls between their views solidified? Yeah. What's happening there? So, I mean, I think there what you get is sort of two things. One, there are some broad moral norms that liberals, conservatives, people who are nonpartisan uh, would agree with. And those tend to revolve around uh, moral norms about how uh, I should care about other people or like treating people roughly fairly. Mm -hmm. But there are other types of moral norms where liberals and conservatives might really disagree. Uh, in particular, values uh, surrounding or norms surrounding things like uh, people's sexual behavior. And there, what we seem to see is that uh, if you are an individual who holds uh, a view that maybe is deemed by others as being sort of outside of a set, a set of norms, uh, feeling like an outgroup member actually causes you to sort of uh, solidify your moral views, that you sort of put up walls in those types of cases. Uh, so, so I think there, there's a little bit of both going on in this case. I recently read something, I can't remember where I read this, but um, it was a study that suggests that human beings are hardwired in a sense to see their positions as right yes. and to defend them. And is that kind of the, the defensive reaction you're talking That's about? That's exactly here? it. That, yeah. that we are fundamentally motivated to believe that the way that we view the world is the true and accurate way that the world exists. And so you can imagine if you have a particular moral worldview and other people are telling you that that moral worldview is backwards or wrong or something like that, then you're going to be motivated not just to maintain your worldview, but actually to strengthen it, to bolster it, to uh, in order to to sort of protect your way of thinking about yourself that you do indeed see the world accurately. In that, it case. seems to me that that might explain some of the sense of which some religious individuals feel persecuted by a secular world and. and and build those kind of walls of defense around the values they cherish. Yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely true. That, uh, and I think one of one thing that's really important here is is empathy sh sort of going both ways. That understanding that people can have different moral worldviews, but those worldviews are not necessarily good or bad. And uh, I think we'll we'll talk about this in a moment. Like talking yeah. about values, as you said, <laughs> that the moral worldviews that people have may be different. Uh, but it's important to try to understand where those worldviews come from, and I think that'll be a sort of important way of tearing down some of these walls rather than uh, sort of motivating people to, to really defend their points of view. Well, let's, let's talk about values yeah. since we seem to be headed that direction. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, uh, I know you've done one study uh, that looks at value, moral values as related to the LGBTQ community. Yes. 
Um, and um, I'll, I'll let you talk about it, but it involves notions of sanctity mm -hmm. um, and how sanctity informs values towards sexuality. So yeah. uh, maybe begin by defining how you're using the word sanctity here and then, and then describe uh, what you found uh, when the, uh, the idea of sanctity is, um, is brought into the equation here mm -hmm. with moral values. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the way that we're thinking about sanctity here is uh, not in uh, the sort of broad way that uh, you might think of it in terms of like religion or uh, theology, but sanctity here is a particular moral value that people hold on to mm -hmm. that, or that they believe in that sort of uh, encompasses the belief that moral behaviors or behaviors might be coded as wrong in virtue of uh, them being something that might defile your body, uh, they might be dirty, or they might defile your soul, uh, mm -hmm. so that they're things that uh, God might not approve of. Uh, and so this has to do with uh, lots of different types of behaviors, but one place where it seems to be really important is in how people think about and moralize sexual behavior. Right. And this is kind of where uh, my research comes in with perceptions of LGBTQ individuals. Right. So sanctity here is referring not necessarily to religious ideas in general, but rather with uh, laws of purity. Yes, uh, in a a sense. absolutely. And I guess could could extend beyond religion even. Um, oh. You could have political laws of purity. For absolutely. Example. So I mean, one really interesting thing is uh, both liberals and conservatives care about sanctity, mm -hmm. but they care about sanctity in sort of different ways. Uh, so this is not something that is uh, bound up with religion or conservatism per se, uh, but like so conservatives uh, think about uh, tend to think about sanctity more in terms of norms about sexuality, where, but liberals have a similar type of, of sanctity concern that has to do with more like, often like purity of food, so like uh, not wanting things with GMOs in right, it right. Uh, or things like that. So yeah, it's something that actually extends beyond just religion or partisanship. So you've created a kind of uh, sanctity scale, if mm -hmm. you will, that you, you measure a level of one's sanctity, whether it be conservative or liberal, mm -hmm. and then you relate that then to attitudes toward values. And what have, what have you found? Yeah, uh, so in a series of studies, we have looked at people's sort of just naturally occurring values. So we've asked people just a very straightforward question or about how much they care about sanctity. Mm -hmm. And then we've looked at how that influences the way that they think about uh, LGBT individuals, how they think about their minds. So to what degree do you think uh, someone who's gay or someone who's a lesbian or someone who's transgender, uh, to what degree do you think that they are like rational? Do they have fully rational human minds? This is a phenomenon that we so, uh, sometimes call dehumanization. Mm -hmm. So if you say that the person doesn't have a rational mind, you are essentially dehumanizing them a little bit. Uh, and so we've looked at how these sanctity values are connected to this dehumanization and also sort of downstream from that, how uh, sanctity values predict uh, prejudice behavior and prejudice attitudes. Right. And what we've found in these studies is that people who tend to value sanctity more uh, tend, to be, uh, tend to view individuals who are gay, lesbian, transgendered as being slightly less human than, than others. And that selective dehumanization has some uh, sort of troubling downstream effects that that tends to predict uh, being more prejudiced, mm -hmm. uh, being less willing to help uh, gay men and women, uh, as well as being more prone to vote for discriminatory public policy. So uh, relevant to North Carolina, like being in favor of something like House Bill 2 and the, right. the so-called bathroom law. So it seems maybe this is what, uh, in, in more lay language, you might refer to as self-righteous behavior or self-righteous indignation or as as applied to certain moral values? Is that, is that kind of what you're measuring here? Yeah, a, a little bit. And, and I think it's really important to, to pull apart that like the sanctity values, as you said earlier, right. don't necessarily correlate with someone being religious. That it right. isn't that like by virtue of being religious that people express these prejudices. Uh, the sanctity piece is actually independent in some sense of, of religiosity. So people who are religious or aren't religious can show this same type of bias. But what we are showing is something more akin to, as you're saying, sort of a self-righteousness. Right. Do you find that um, the, this re the inverse relationship between sanctity and values, or um, does that correlate also with other kind of value statements, not necessarily the LGBTQ community, but uh, does this correlate to prejudicial feelings, say, against um, members of other races? Um, yeah. And that kind of same dynamic going on. Right. So what we found in our series of studies is actually it seems to be sort of laser focused 
on LGBT groups. So in some of our studies, we looked at prejudice towards other types of outgroups or mm -hmm. other groups that are typically the target of prejudice. So we looked at uh, perceptions of African Americans. Right. Uh, we've also looked at perceptions uh, and bias towards people who are obese. Both groups uh, that are, are typically or that typically experience some degree of prejudice in their lives. And what we showed is that the sanctity value predicts prejudice towards LBGTQ groups, but not towards African Americans mm. and not towards uh, obese individuals. So it actually seems to be something, the, the sort of explanation that we have for it is, if you're a person who really values sanctity a whole lot, then you might perceive people who you think as sort of as violating these types of sanctity values as a sort of moral outgroup. You might perceive their minds differently. And then that then influences this uh, sort of increase in prejudice. Seems like it's invaluable information here um, as, as we try to understand uh, dynamics in society mm -hmm. um, and um, surrounding morality and values. This is just uh, fascinating information uh, to have in your arsenal. So Thank it's you. Very Thank important. you. Um, we have a little time left. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, I, I could talk about this all day, but in the little bit of time we have left, um, I have to touch upon another kind of um, concept that you're trying to measure in the lab mm -hmm. uh, that has been important in theological discussions virtually across every religion, mm -hmm. but particularly it seems to me in um, Islamic, uh, Jewish, and, and Christian traditions, and that's this concept of free will Yeah. and, ha and how the idea of free will uh, interacts with uh, the way we consider moral, more morality, and moral judgments taking place mm -hmm. in society. So, how do you go about um, measuring something like free will and, and measuring its impact on morality? Yeah. So this is this is a really tough nut that my lab has been trying to, to crack for some time now, uh, because if you go and you ask people, do you have free will? Mm -hmm. Almost everyone will say yes. In fact, there was a cross-cultural study done looking at people across the world asking various versions of, do you believe in free will? And what they found is uh, above 80% of people believe that they have free will. So this mm -hmm. is something that uh, humans, regardless of your sort of cultural context, really believe in strongly. Now, the, this, where the rub comes in is, so everyone believes that they have free will. But what do they think that free will entails? Right. So what does it mean specifically? Like if I say I have free will, what am I saying that I have? Uh, and in some of the early work that my lab has done, we ask people this very simple question that when you say you have free will, what does that mean to you? And what we found was that people have a very everyday psychological explanation for free will. So to them, what they think free will means is that I have the ability to make choices, mm -hmm. um, that no one is coercing me, that there's no sort of external constraints, also that my mind is working sort of in the correct way, that I don't have, uh, that I, I uh, don't have like any sort of like mental disabilities, or there's like not a brain tumor in my head yeah. that's sort of like pushing on <laughs> weird parts of right. my brain. Right. That's fascinating. So the, the, the normal person, when you ask about free will, they don't care about Aquinas. No. Uh, they, they don't care about the Buddha, they, and they're not involved in these kind of uh, very scholarly discussions about the types of free will versus determinism. But they're essentially um, talking about their, the own, their own sense of self yes. that allows them to um, have control, I guess, over mm -hmm. what they're uh, performing in their lives. That, that's exactly right. And, and you're right. Like They're not worried about, about Aquinas, but free will is still a deeply important concept that, that people have. And uh, in, in the work that my lab is doing, it shows that if you threaten that belief in free will, uh, if you sort of can convince people that they don't have free will, if you tell them right. something like, uh, we can look at brain imaging studies, and we can show that uh, if you, that your neurons sort of decide before you're consciously aware of that. That's, yeah, and uh, that's, that's really fascinating. And I hope that your work um, will inform our work, and that this sort of uh, work would open up possibilities of uh, kind of interdisciplinary work between Absolutely. religious studies and uh, psychology. But we're out of time. Uh -huh. I, I could do this all day, like I said. And that's it for Religion and Life uh, for today. Until next week, this is Ozzy Schwartz.